Good morning, everyone. Uh, much to the benefit of all, I have a bit of a cold today, so I'll limit my speaking to, to a extremely uh, few things. <clears throat> uh, good morning. I'm Councilmember Joe Borelli, and I'm chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I want to thank the public for attending today's hearing, and would like to acknowledge the committee members who are here currently. That is just uh, the only punctual member uh, of the City Council, Justin Brannon, who, like me, has probably the furthest commute uh, of the committee members that are uh, on the committee. Regarding the subject of today's hearing, the committee will conduct an oversight portion related to emergency service needs in response to population shifts in New York City. In addition, uh, we will hear three reporting bills, all of which I'm the prime sponsor, intro 744, which require the fire department to report on emergency medical services, supervisor to battalion staffing ratios. Intro 745 will require the fire department to report on the effect of rezonings between 2002 and 2013 on department resources. And intro 746 would require the fire department to annually report on its new needs based on rezonings that occurred during the previous year. As we all know, uh, the FDNY has historically and continues to do an excellent job responding promptly to fire and medical emergencies. Uh, during today's oversight portion of the hearing, we want to make sure that this remains the case. Even as our city has seen a robust increase in population growth over its past decade, uh, our city's bravest and best continue to have the resources they need to protect the public. We're all interested in examining the overall nature of how the FDNY evaluates and addresses the needs for emergency services when it deals with large population shifts in New York City. <clears throat> we also want to take a look at several areas relating to potential new emergency service needs, which include examining the fire department's general preparation for increases in population and density for areas where there is a construction boom, and what equation is used by the FDNY to prevent inadequate emergency services to areas with an increased population density. Lastly, we hope to learn more about the coordination of efforts made by all city agencies involved in this planning process. In addition to the oversight proportion of the hearing, we'll hear three bills which I discussed uh, earlier in my opening remarks. We anticipate the department will provide testimony on this legislation, allowing us to get a better understanding of their portion, uh, position rather, on the three bills. It is my firm belief that these bills will allow the council to identify the FDNY's needs, particularly how such rezonings impact the department's needs with regard to personnel, equipment, vehicle, and station location. I would ask those members of the administration who plan to testify to please state your name for the record uh, and raise your right hand as the committee council administers the oath. <coughs> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, good morning, uh, John Sudnick, Chief Operations. I do. Rick Olin, Deputy Commissioner for Strategy and Policy. I do. James Poole, Chief VMS. I do. John Benanti, Deputy Commissioner of Supply Services. I do. Okay. Good morning, Chair Borelli and all of the council members present. My name is John Sudnick, and I am the Chief of Operations for the New York City Fire Department. I am joined today by Chief of EMS James Booth, Deputy Commissioner for Support Services John Benanti, and Deputy Commissioner for Strategic Initiatives Edward Dolan. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about evaluating emergency service needs in response to population shifts. As the council members present are aware, New York City has seen a steady increase in real estate development in the past 10 to 15 years due to rezoning and redevelopment throughout the city. We know that there are additional rezonings planned and likely more coming. The demand for fire and emergency medical services has increased in recent years and it is expected to continue increasing as additional development projects are completed in the next 15 to 20 years. <coughs> While in the past, the department has always worked with the mayor's office and our partner agencies to ensure that we could provide sufficient coverage to meet growing needs. The recent spate of large-scale development has resulted in us taking an even more proactive pr approach. We know from experience that capital projects to build or expand department resources can take a long time to develop, so we are currently improving and streamlining this process. <coughs> Generally speaking, the fire department comes to a decision to build new facilities in a few different ways. Sometimes we are forced to adapt to emergency conditions, such as the closure of a hospital that hosts an EMS station. Other times, <coughs> excuse me, other times the decision to create a new or different facility is driven by a trend in response times that we want to address. In some cases, we are able to convert existing fire department facilities into a different type of resource, such, such as an EMS station. In other cases, we work 
with fellow city agencies such as the Department of City Planning and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to find locations that are suitable for our operational needs. The Department's Management Analysis and Planning Unit, along with my team in the Bureau of Operations, monitors and evaluates both daily and long-term performance metrics, including incident responses and type resource development, uh, resource deployment, re uh, response times, and overall effectiveness in our response and handling of emergencies across the city. We are always looking at one key objective, how can we improve our operations? We know that major rezonings are often accompanied by growth in daytime and residential populations. A surge of people in a given location can lead to increased fire and medical calls which can, in turn, lead to decreased availability of FDNY resources and longer response times. Given what we've learned from past rezonings, earlier this year, Commissioner Nigro instructed senior leadership to create a facility planning work group to focus specifically on the issue of addressing long-term facility needs in a more proactive manner. This work group, which includes representatives from a variety of agency units, including support services, management analysis and planning, fire operations, and EMS operations will review zone rezonings and other developments that lead to changes in department operations or response times. In addition, the Department of City Planning has indicated to the FDNY that if a development being rezoned requires an environmental in impact statement, EIS, FDNY should be aware of these, those proposals. To that end, DCP will send the scoping notices for projects preparing an EIS to the FDNY prior, uh, prior to the scoping meeting. FDNY will also be involved with the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination's work regarding city-sponsored rezoning actions. It is worth noting that although this hearing is on rezonings, rezoning actions are the source of only a sliver of all redevelopments and growth in the city. Only a small degree of new developments are the result of uh, recent zoning changes. FDNY is focused on protecting and planning for population changes, the vast majority of which will come from uh, as a right of development that is not part of a recent rezoning. I'd like to sp speak briefly about the legislation proposed today. Introduction 746 would require the fire department to report annually on its new needs based on rezonings that occurred during the previous year. We support this bill, though we would like to address the language to specify that it covers significant rezonings rather than all rezonings in the city. Introduction 744 would require the fire department to report on emergency medical services supervisor to battalion staffing ratios. We understand that this legislation is meant to provide for greater transparency around span of control statistics, and we support this bill. However, we are uncertain about the use of battalion and division in the text, and we would like to suggest amending the language to reflect reporting on these categories by division only, which reflects the way we actually operate. Introduction 745 would require the fire department to report the effect on department resources of significant rezonings in the city between 2002 and 2013. We appreciate that this bill creates a standard for defining significant rezonings. However, given the large number of significant rezonings over the course of those 12 years, the analysis that is called for in the legislation would be time consuming, burdensome, and not likely to yield useful information moving forward. Our data specialists are now fully engaged in analyzing real-time data, so we are concerned about the prospect of devoting significant resources to this backwards-looking canvas. However, we are open-minded about this topic, and perhaps if the Council is able to articulate the specific goal of the legislation, we can find a less burdensome way of reaching that goal. I would be happy to take your questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, coming. Um, <clears throat> can we just go through the uh, how the department now would handle uh, a, a case like uh, Hudson Yards, a large rezoning 
and how would, how would the process go where you would project the future needs? Well, uh, like I mentioned in the testimony, uh, we, we, are, we have developed at by commissioner's uh, request a um, facility planning work group that will address sig these significant rezonings going forward. Um, so in the case of a future development like Hudson Yards, uh, we would be, uh, have the input from not just the uh, various bureaus and units within the fire department convening and discussing the issues uh, and the impacts of, of that, that type of development, but we'd also uh, collaborate with other uh, city agencies in that regard as well. So, so then what teeth does the department have in uh, making sure that when developments come, uh, d developments like cuts and yards, uh, when they get passed in the council a decade prior, what teeth does the department have to ensure that the adequate resources are built into the plan as it's being developed? Well, I'm not quite certain what you mean by teeth, but um, I think being at the table uh, and uh, discussing what our potential needs would be uh, is a um, is, 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 is what we would expect uh, at any, any one of these large developments. Um, I think that, uh, I think a representative at those planning meetings uh, would be useful and, uh, uh, and also beneficial to the city in, in analyzing the needs. And, and that, that being said, it's, um, you know, it's difficult to, to predict in, in some cases, although we do have uh, good models for predicting um, until it's actually built uh, it, it would be uh, you know it would be difficult to say exactly what type of resources and where uh, you know uh, uh, where we would locate them but be being at the table is an important step I would think but but Hudson Yards essentially is, is building a, a new city um, that that is the size of you know other cities that would be considered uh, large, meaning over 100,000 people. And if you look at a comparable size city, Fort Lauderdale, they have 11 fire stations. So with the population growth of that one rezoning and the 65 to 70,000 daily visitors in office buildings, um, just how, how does it happen that we are in construction and there doesn't seem to be uh, an agreement on the placement of uh, an EMS station. And I'm, I'm not blaming you, I'm, I'm actually yep. blaming the, the, the planning uh, going into this, but that, that we're now on our back step hoping to find something. Yeah, well, um, you know, in, in hindsight, I, I think what, what we, uh, what would be, would have been beneficial back when uh, Hudson Yards was being planned is if we could have identified a location uh, for um, to uh, for a facility to put potential resources uh, in that area. Um, again, the type of resources that that are required would require some further analysis that likely wouldn't uh, come to fruition until after the uh, the development was was built. Um, and and it, it just doesn't include the the the, um, the 13 acre site. And the West Rail Yards, it includes the, the whole rezoning development um, for I think it's a 59 square block area. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that uh, if we had an opportunity to identify a potential location for a facility, um, that would be beneficial. Uh, l let me just say also that um, you know, if, if in any type of uh, area or development, if we do, if the fi if the fire department. Um, uh, requires additional needs as far as resources w we do provide that we have we have uh, we're fortunate in the sense that we're the largest fire department in the United States the second largest in the world uh, we are resource rich and we can uh, deploy and redeploy our resources uh, as need be and we do that on a regular basis um, for example if uh, if we anticipate that we're going to have an increase in workload 
uh, for an impending storm or due to a, um, uh, you know, some other type of event, uh, whether it's a, you know, a, a protest or some other a parade, uh, we, we do uh, deploy additional resources in anticipation of increased activity. Uh, so uh, we could do the same thing on, on, a, on a regular basis if we, uh, if we determine that there was going to be a, a need. I think what we're talking about here is long-term planning and, and putting resources into, into a facility uh, that's been predetermined into an area that has the potential for an increase in population. <coughs> yeah, I mean, just to clarify the goals of the bill, it seems as though the council has some, some cognitive dissonance when uh, it comes to fire and EMS resources as compared to um, parks and, and schools. Because when we deal with a, a rezoning here, you know, the, the council is aware of the school seats that are needed, uh, the, the need to preserve some portions of the property for open space, and these are sort of built into the, to the, to the zoning requirements. And then, of course, there's the other infrastructure needs like sewage and things like that. Uh, it just, it, from our standpoint, it just seems as though there, this doesn't exist uh, with the way the FDNY uh, is treated during the rezoning planning. Uh, so just, just to give you an, a question, in, uh, in Brooklyn by the Barclays Center, do, do you guys, have you, are you aware of how many more emergency responses to the firehouse on Dean Street goes to now that that project's been, been developed? Uh, sure, we can get that information for you. Uh, we monitor those uh, statistics and uh, response patterns, response activity on a regular basis. Um, uh, so, uh, and any any rezonings or any building that's going on, we we certainly uh, keep track and monitor the additional any additional workload that those uh, those projects uh, create. But so l let's assume the number is 50% more runs. Um, if that's the case with that firehouse and there's additional runs in a number of adjacent firehouses uh, and the department decides that, yes, we, we, we do need additional resources in the area, would we not be on our back foot then having to initiate a, an acquisition, perhaps uh, a larger capital project, the construction of a firehouse? Yeah, I, again, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I think that we, uh, we, going forward, we'd like to uh, have a more significant uh, seat at the table, if you will, to, uh, to identify, you know, these locations of potential facilities going forward. Um, uh, you know, again, in, in if, if we had some, any type of immediate uh, or emergent need to address an increase in activity, whether it's uh, runs or response times or uh, fire activity, em uh, medical, e emergency medical activity, we do address those and we will address those going forward. Uh, I can tell you um, for now, we have been meeting those needs, although those, I'm certain those units um, uh, have increased to, to a degree. Again, I don't have the, sti the, the exact statistics in, in, uh, in front of me here, but uh, but they have been meeting those needs. <coughs> um, when in the past uh, two or three decades uh, has there ever been, with the exception of the ambulance tours that are added uh, when hospital systems uh, stop providing ambulance service, but has there ever been uh, an expansion in the number of fire companies and EMS uh, units that are in the city as a result of the population increase? I guess a better way to ask that is when did, when did we stop building firehouses and adding companies uh, in correlation with the population? Well, in, in the 90s, we added a ladder company in South Jamaica. Uh, and then um, m more recent than that, we added a, a company, uh, fire companies, an EMS station in Rossville, Staten Island. So just to give you an example, so Rossville 168 was built. Um, and that was probably the only company that, that opened in Staten Island in, in 30 years. And in the probably the 30 years between 1980 and 2010, the, the population of Staten Island uh, grew by probably 33 to 35, 36 percent. Um, so the number of companies only increased by 4 percent. Let's just use a, a rough number. I mean, is that is that something that you guys feel is problematic, or or is that 
are, are the new construction materials, uh, the new sprinkler system, et cetera, is there just less of a need? Yeah, I, again, I, I, we appreciate the, that we're having a conversation here about uh, adding uh, fire department resources. I really do because for a number of years we were, uh, the discussion was more about reducing fire resources. So certainly, uh, from my perspective anyway, we appreciate that conversation. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, I don't know, uh, I'll leave this up to the management analysis and planning unit to determine, you know, uh, exactly where our resources and how many resources and the type. Uh, ba and after they run th that analysis and that data and they run it by me and, and fire operations to determine, you know, where and if we need additional resources. But, um, you know, so generally speaking, uh, you know, population is only one of the factors that are taken into consideration when additional, when you're making an analysis on additional resources. So uh, it depends on the type of, you know, demographics, uh, you know, fire activity, uh, response times. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a whole host of things that uh, our, our MAPS unit takes a look at when they run those numbers. So, um, so while it would, it would, it would not disappoint me particularly if we, if we um, opened up additional uh, resources. We do understand that there are, you know, resources uh, and budgets are limited. And I think what, what we're trying to do is uh, analyze, but given a, a certain, uh, 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 given the constraint of limited resources, where, where we're best able to locate those additional resources. And if it's Staten Island happens to be the, the place based on the criteria that we analyze, then that'll be the place. I, I completely agree. Uh, it's just that when it comes to parks and open space, uh, there doesn't seem to be a problem for the administration to take over the maintenance of, uh, you know, a new park when we, when we rezone properties and stuff like that. Uh, just turning to uh, intro 744 and the other bills quickly, you said that you, you, you would prefer different language used than battalion slash division. What, um, w what better language w would you mean? In other words, that, that's not addressing how you, uh, how you actually stratify the EMS core. Okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll probably defer to Chief EMS, Chief Booth on this, but uh, uh, generally um, uh, the way we currently operate is uh, as per EMS division, not battalion. Uh, Chief Booth, do you want to comment more on that? Sure. Uh, <coughs> currently the way the, 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 the battalion uh, wording came from the, the merger in 1996. That's a, a fire operations term. And initially when we uh, uh, merged to the fire department, they redesignated areas as battalion areas. Um, we've since uh, gone back to, on the EMS uh, side, two divisions. Each division is basically a borough, uh, except in Staten Island where you get a little bit of Brooklyn South. And uh, within the division, there are ambulance stations, uh, not battalions. Um, that's where that comes from. And uh, specifically, again, on 744, do, do you think there are areas and neighborhoods uh, within the five boroughs that, that there is an identified need that, that the department has identified, or the resources are not there? I, I think that what we do is we, as Chief Sudnick said, we rely on management analysis and planning to help guide us, uh, looking at uh, call volume, looking at uh, what's going on in the neighborhoods uh, to uh, understand the, the needs of the department. Uh, you know, so we rely on, on to be guided by them. And just my last question on this bill. Uh, so w what, what is the current ratio of uh, EMS to supervisors and is there variance by borough or division? And, and <coughs> I guess start with what's the, what's the goal ratio and then what's the actual ratio and, and is there variance? Well, uh, EMS supervision uh, is basically, there's a uh, per ambulance station, there's a, a, an officer that remains indoors in quarters and basically uh, runs the administrative end of it. And then there's an officer that's uh, in the field in the station uh, response area and uh, they oversee the general activities of uh, the ambulance crews uh, in the field. Um, when there is an incident uh, within uh, the geographic area of let, let's say an ambulance station a fire, building collapse, large car accident, uh, and the complexity of the incident uh, gets larger. Um, we add to that level of supervision 
by relocating uh, offices and redeploying offices to augment and to safely make sure that our members can do their job. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, just going back to then uh, intro uh, 745 and 746, uh, when it came to 745, uh, the, you, you guys had said that it would be burdensome to go back and reevaluate because it's something you're already essentially looking at. But then do, do you, because of the answer on 745, does that mean it's even more important to pass something like 746, which forces us to evaluate these things before? And I agree with your change about making significant the, uh, an operable term because every time we rezone on something, it shouldn't be done. Um, but because of what you said on 745, does that make the need for 746 even more critical? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a good way to look at that, um, you know, based on, uh, you know, if, if, again, hindsight, if, if we, uh, uh, if, 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 if we looked at this annually, um, 2002, um, there would likely be a, a location that we would have pre-identified for a potential, uh, a, a potential facility. Um, again, se 745, although it's backward looking, and it would be burdensome to, to try to ana analyze what's happening over the past 11 years and, and, and all that re redevelopment. Certainly, at least taking a cursory look at it, I think we'd be able to, um, you know, g gain some insight as to, you know, how, uh, how would we best proceed going forward. And then just my last question, I'll turn it over to uh, the other, by the, we're joined by uh, Council Member Alan Maisel as well. Um, just think one last question on 745 then w would you be opposed to then just uh, rewording the legislation to uh, just make it so that you report publicly in whatever format you're already doing report publicly on prior rezonings is that what you're asking as, as the department's going through its analysis of the of the population development in areas that were rezoned uh, would it be just easier to uh, to just report on what you're already doing. Okay. Uh, um, I think we'll take a look at that and uh, we'll let you know about that going forward. Okay. I saw the coach call the plays over Thank there. You. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Justin. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think you, you guys obviously do a fantastic job, but I don't want you to be too proud to admit if you need more resources, right? And that's why we're here. Um, I think the chairs, you know, brings up a great topic that as the city is growing by leaps and bounds, we got to make sure that we're providing for all this this growth, um, and we're here to support that. Um, I think the chair really covered everything, but something that's sort of germane to my district is the the uh, proliferation of illegal conversions. Um, I wanted to get an idea just of um, uh, the frequency that you're seeing that, or or you know, in areas that are growing. Um, I know. Southern Brooklyn, some parts of Queens, um, if you're seeing that more and more, if it's still sort of uh, exclusive to certain areas in, in uh, throughout the boroughs? Well, you know, illegal conversions are nothing new. Um, you know, we, we uh, you know, we have a very large city. Uh, we have a limited housing stock. We have a growing population. I think uh, common sense will tell you that uh, you'd probably see an increase uh, in that regard. Um, you know, that said, <coughs> we do have a, a robust fire prevention uh, and inspection um, a, a unit that will uh, take a look and, and, and try to locate um, uh, and uh, enforce the code on illegal, uh, illegal conversions when we find them. Um, again, there's, uh, there is some uh, uh, there, there is a proposal to um, to uh, include basement occupancies uh, as and, and legalizing basement occupancies throughout the city. Uh, our Bureau of Fire Prevention is looking at that very closely um, with other uh, with other agencies to determine if uh, what the requirements for that would be. So that's one way that uh, the city is attempting to address you know that shortage of housing stock. So uh, it would include uh, egress requirements and uh, in some cases sprinkler uh, requirements and things like that. 
I guess on that issue too, if there are things that arise that you feel you, you know department's hands are tied, I mean it's you know uh, it's up to us to to help you know craft legislation that allows you to, to do that work. So um, I know that when the buildings department comes and knocks on people's doors, they don't answer. But when the fire department comes, they do. Um, so if there's ways we can make your life easier and making sure people are safe and first responders are safe, I mean um, that's why we're here too. So thank you. Thank you. It's probably the axes at the door. I would, I would let people in. Um, Councilmember Mazel, you had a question? Yes, uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate your gentleman being here. Um, my district, uh, along with many other districts, has something called community driveways. Um, a significant number of uh, developments were built where there's access to the back. And that's where people park their cars. If there's a fire, um, it's important for the uh, fire trucks to get into the back. But because these are, this is private property, uh, many of these uh, community driveways have people who are parking their cars illegally, they're blocking uh, entrances, or they're blocking access to uh, the community driveway itself. Um, I've had numerous calls over the years of people who are very concerned about uh, access for the fire department and what happens in case of a fire. Um, is there a, do you have a policy about uh, in investigating uh, complaints with regard to these uh, blockages? Um, I know I get complaints that people call 311 and nothing ever happens. Uh, I'm just not familiar with this. Is it Staten Island? Brooklyn. Oh, Brooklyn. Okay. Uh, uh, mostly Canarsie, Mill Basin. Okay. Uh, we, we have, I, I'm not too familiar with the, uh, that issue in, in your area. Uh, I know Staten Island had some issues with that as far as private ro roadways are concerned. And uh, our San city planning unit in the Bureau of Operations has been dealing um, with those developments and trying to come up with a, um, you know, solutions. And a lot of these uh, private roads are uh, not within the jurisdiction of the New York City Fire Department. So it's more of a, um, a uh, en enforcement issue and we've been working with, um, I guess, the, uh, the, the, the boards of these private communities. I, if that's what you're referring well, to. Well, the problem, the problem with uh, what uh, we have in, uh, in the 46th Council District is that the community driveways were built 50, 60 years ago with no thought of a governance structure uh, so that basically people have an easement, they're allowed to use the driveways, but there, are no, there is no f uh, formula for people to get together to uh, actually have a, an organization that would require certain rules to be followed, um, dues to be paid to fix <coughs> the roads. Now, over the last 10 years, if you do build a private community, it's built in, there's an organization structure built into the, uh, into the deed. But 50, 60 years ago, nobody was thinking what would happen uh, later on in, in, uh, in the future, and nobody ever dealt with it. And I'm trying to craft the legislation that would um, allow some kind of formal structure to be developed. But in the meantime, we do have cases where cars, we cannot find out where these cars are from. People just leave their cars there uh, without license plates. Uh, it's very hard to get them towed. Uh, police department says we don't want to go on the property because it's private, but the police department does have an overriding interest in this because obviously if you have to get to a fire and you can't, uh, it's a problem. Well, I, 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 I tell you we, we'd be more than happy in the fire department to help any way we can. Um, if we can get together with, um, with our partners, whether it's NYPD for enforcement or DOT or whoever it is, um, certainly uh, if you want to uh, I'll give you my card and we could we be, could be delighted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we were joined by uh, Council Member uh, Fernando Cabrera, who is suffering from vertigo. So uh, I hope you guys are ready just uh, in case. <laughs> he, he took my advice, though, and stood behind the yellow line, I see. Uh, just uh, two, two more quick questions uh, about the working group that includes representatives from city agencies. Uh, wh wh what does that group do, and then if a resource is needed, what's the protocol for identifying a location? Okay, so the group actually is coming together for the first time in a couple of weeks, so this is something that the commissioners just charged us with putting together. 
Um, we're basically looking at operational priorities and needs assessment. Uh, the group is made up of uh, fire operations, EMS operations, support services, which is the group that does the buildings and the facilities, our intergovernmental people, and our planning unit, of course, and our management analysis group. Uh, we're going to be meeting bi-weekly to go over all of the issues, um, and then we're going to be setting up quarterly meetings with Department of City Planning. Um, I, I have tremendous amount of respect for the commissioner. Um, I, I don't believe he is, you know, like a, a, a Jackson Pollock who just, you know, splat some paint uh, on, on the canvas. I think there was probably a reason why the working group was formed then, if it was recently formed. Could that be because of some of the, the, the problems with identifying locations from past rezonings and the, the desire not to do that again going forward? Uh, no, I don't think that's correct. I think the reason for the working group is because there's more rezonings now than there had been. Uh, our, as the chief had mentioned, our planning unit has been very proactive in the past in making sure that, you know, based on, um, on headcount and, and all other priorities that we're able to do this. Um, but again, it's because there's more rezonings coming in the pipeline. We wanted a tighter fit um, and a more structured way of doing this. The, the last question is on the uh, uh, city planning scoping notices. What, what are the details that go that come with the scoping notice, and, and what does it actually entail? What does it look like? City plan. Do, do, you, do you have a, a, a statement to make as well? No. Okay, so please. So good morning. My name is Purnima Kapoor. I'm the executive director at City Planning. So scoping notices are um, sent out for projects that require an environmental impact statement, and they include um, details about the proposal, include what is projected to be developed as part of the actions, lists all of the actions that are being proposed, projected development, compares it to the current situation as well. So it gives a good sense of what is to be developed in terms of buildings, in terms of projected, you know, as you said, school seats, other things. So the, num the population increase is part of that. So in your opinion, it, it, since it, it involves the uh, a calculation of the density, uh, the, the projected number of residents, projected number of office uh, square footage, do you think that's enough to, to give to uh, the department to plan their operations? Um, I mean, that is the basis of the decision makers making a decision on a, on a certain action. So I'm assuming, you know, the fire department would take that information and project based on their calculus what the needs would be. However, I want to point out that many of this, you know, larger city initiated um, rezonings, um, a as the chief said here, are multi-year uh, sort of projections. So, you know, these get built out over 10, 20, sometimes longer than that, so. So I, I love city planning. I think you guys do a wonderful job. And um, sometimes I see the schematic designs of uh, future rezonings or the agency's planning uh, down the road. And you always see open spaces for parks and you see the little school buildings drawn in there. Do we not draw the little, little fire stations with those things? Um, my understanding, and the fire department can speak better to it, is that the fire department is constantly reviewing their needs. Okay, thank you guys, appreciate it. Okay. Uh, do, you have, do you have any questions? No, thank you, appreciate it. <clears throat> Next, we'll call up uh, Oren, Daryl, and Michael.
I guess we'll start left to right or right to left, or whoever, whoever wants to go first. Or Good morning, Chairperson Borelli and committee members. My name is Oren Barzale, President of Local 2507. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today with regards to the issue of evaluating emergency medical services needs in response to population shifts and the fire department report on the effect of rezoning. On March 8, 2018, a hearing was held by your committee on FDNY preliminary budget for fiscal year 2019 and expanding operations. I was not able to attend that hearing. A few, e a few key issues were mentioned that I would like to briefly discuss today. During the March co hearing, Commissioner Nigro testified that 186 tours have been added to the EMS budget since 2014. While we are greatly thankful for the FDNY and the city for adding additional resources to an already overworked, overstretched service, but we need more as the demand for EMS continuously increases. Our headcount has significantly increased in recent, year, in recent years, yet our facility counts have remained the same with the exception of one tactical trailer facility added in Queens. Our EMS battalions are busting at the seams with personnel. Most of our stations are designed to hold five to six units. Now they hold 10, 11, sometimes 14, if not more. This is a health and safety issue for our members. For example, EMS Brooklyn EMS Station 57. The station is so overstretched that lockers are on the apparatus floor. Our female members have to either change on the open floor or take their clothes and go to another room to change. Brooklyn Battalion 40. The station was overcrowded with FDNY vehicles that the community complained to the proper channels. Last year, that station was decompressed by a few units, sending them to other stations that are already over the limit. Queens Battalion 54, dozens of members are with no lockers. A station designed for five to six units now houses about a dozen units. Stan Island, the third largest borough, 58 square miles with a population of approximately half a million, yet there are only two EMS stations in the entire island. Bronx Battalion 15, an old firehouse that was handed down to EMS, a building that's over 100 years old. The building is a hazard to all, to all that work there. Walls are cracking, equipment stored next to bloodborne area where EMS crews clean their equipment, which is leaking to the basement area, contaminating other areas. EMS Battalion 26 in the Bronx, a facility that currently holds about 90 employees. One third are females. The male locker room has three stalls and three showers, while the women's have one stall and one shower. On numerous occasions, the women have been forced to use the male restroom while there is a line to the women's restroom or when the toilet is broken. Furthermore, our occupation exposes us to many hazards, one being bloodborne pathogens, in which our crews must return to the station for a status that referred as BBP, a status that places our crews off service so they can clean themselves off from bloodborne pathogen soiled uniforms. There has been occasions in which one crew member is forced to remain in soiled uniform while the other is showering, again due to the lack of showers in the female restroom. Bloodborne pathogens, which consist of blood, fecal matter, vomit, and all other body secretions, such as amniotic fluid from post delivery of a child. It is unjust that our members have to wait to cleanse themselves in a timely fashion. These issues have been addressed with no resolve. These issues are not just isolated to one facility or one borough. It's a systemic issue citywide. Our EMS battalion infrastructure is in need of major adjustment and growth. In 1996, New York City EMS merged with FDNY. We were told the planning for EMS would be 70 battalions citywide. Here we are 22 years later with 37 battalions to date. EMS is bleeding. The pay is so low that we're losing employees every day to other job opportunities. 
the FDNY Financial Commissioner Rush testified that they spent $4,000 on training each EMT and $20,000 on each paramedic. Multiply that by 400 to 600 EMTs a year and 120 paramedics a year that go to our academy each year. That's millions we spend on training people that are not staying. They're taking that training and utilizing it elsewhere with better paying jobs. Attached in my testimony is a study showing survivability increase due to experienced EMTs and paramedics. EMS is not just a job, it's a calling. If you ask anyone as to why they left EMS, they will all say the pay. The FDNY also needs to reinstate the grant program you mentioned in March. We used to have a 5,000 forgivable loan to our EMTs so they can train on the outside to become paramedics. Currently, we have a severe shortage of paramedics. We train anywhere from 60 to 120 paramedics a year. That's simply not enough. Most get promoted or leave for higher paying jobs. We need to give people more. We need to give more people more opportunities to become paramedics. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but that's the reality in FDNY EMS. Community hospital takeover. Recently, FDNY took over its BLS EMT unit covering that area. We couldn't take over the ALS paramedic unit due to paramedic shortages. This once again goes back to my earlier statement about wages within the FDNY. My testimony today consists not of harsh criticism of FDNY, but is an effort to enlighten com committee members to the reality our members are faced with every day. In closing, FDNY EMS is a great job. Commissioner Nigro has been instrumental in improving our needs. I have, however, we need your help. FD, FDNY is known as the bravest. NYPD is known as the strongest. FDNY EMS is known to be the best. Help us be the best. I look forward for, for a chance to work with this committee and the department to remedy these issues and build a stronger FDNY EMS for New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to interrupt for a quick question. <clears throat> um, the, the department didn't have an answer for this, or at least they didn't say it at, at a few minutes earlier. W what is the staffing ratio goal, uh, in your opinion? Uh, and then um, do you know of whether or not there's variance of those ratios between boroughs? Figured you might be able to. C could you break down a little? So uh, we, we had asked them whether uh, there was uh, a difference in the ratio between EMS supervisors to EMS technicians and paramedics uh, and uh, whether there was variance with the, with, between the boroughs. Well, right now, in, let's say for Staten Island, there's two patrol cars in the entire borough. In other boroughs, you have, if you have seven stations, you have seven patrol officers. If you have in the Bronx, I believe they have... Uh, I think they have 10 stations in the Bronx. You have 10 people patrolling. Um, it's, it's from, from my understanding, our ratio is one to 20 on the EMS side. One supervisor per 20 EMTs or paramedics. Thank you. And then we'll go to uh, Michael next, I guess. We'll go down. Daryl, Daryl, okay. Michael's just there for support and good looks. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chairperson, for this committee. My name is Daryl Chalmers. I'm also a Deputy Chief Inspector in the Bureau of Fire Prevention, along with Michael Reardon. Executive Board members of Local 2507, 2507 representing Uniform EMT Paramedics, Fire Protection Inspectors, and Supervising Fire Protection Inspectors. The New York City Fire Department's Bureau of Fire Prevention is a life and safety and revenue producing bureau, generating approximately $85 million annually for the department. The Bureau of Fire Prevention members consist of 360 fire protection inspectors. And I'm saying 360 because we have a class of 50 in right now. So that brings that number up to 360. And the inspection units which check for compliance of all fire buildings code regulations directly related to fire safety. Fire protection inspectors are tasked to inspect and witness testing of safety equipment in buildings for firefighting operations, such as standpipe systems, sprinkler systems, etc at various locations throughout New York City, including our bridges, tunnels, piers, rooftops, 
ladders, subways, construction sites, restaurants, basements, and commercial residential high-rise buildings. Fire protection inspectors make sure that the systems used for firefighting operations on premises are in working order, plus protecting the lives and property of city residents, employees, and visitors. The effort of the fire protection inspectors over the past several years has resulted in a significant reduction of fires, deaths related to fires at a record low in the history of the fire department within the five boroughs of the city of New York. And uh, the re uh, what I wanted to say is before Mike even uh, speaks is that Commissioner Nigro, Chief Leonard, and the rest of the people in the fire department, they have been very supportive of fire prevention with Chief Spatter for. And this is, I'm, I'm being, I've been here 25 years, and this has been the best I've seen with uh, Commissioner Nigel when it comes to us. Um, they take the effort. Chief Leonard is outstanding when it, when it comes to us and the stuff that we do for the safety, for the public and the firefighters. Uh, a lot of times, firefighters don't know what we do. You know, that's something that the fire department's working on trying to teach them in the academy to explain. But our, our main job is to make sure it's safe for them and like the building you're in now. We make sure that this building is safe, that everything is working as far as fire protection inspectors. We're the ones who go out and check these systems constantly, every day. The only buildings we don't get involved in is, is that it's the, we have the greatest firefighters is that private houses. When it comes to private houses, we're not involved in private houses. But any commercial building and residential building, we're in charge of making sure those systems are working so firefighters can get water. All right, so I'm gonna leave it to Mike Reardon to uh, continue. Good morning, City Council members. My name is Michael Ridden. I'm the Deputy Chief Inspector, New York City Fire Department. I also sit on the Executive Board 2507. Fire Prevention Inspectors were the lead inspection group during an extremely dangerous Legionnaire's disease epidemic that spread from the cooling towers throughout the city. Uh, our members did a great job under the uh, guidance of uh, uh, Fire Prevention Chief uh, Spadafore. It was also uh, awarded us a plaque for the diligent work that everybody had performed during that time. Each fire inspector earns a salary of 46,600 and brings in approximately 250,000 per year. With that, we never have a pay increase. We stay at our salary. There's no increase in salary pay for us. Whatever we start at, there's no step pay. There's never been a step pay for us, which we tried at our last negotiation. And wasn't, it didn't work out for us. 75% of New, New York City Department of Building Inspectors have cars, whereas we have only one car for every fire protection inspector. A lot of our inspectors work in the fire boroughs of the city of New York. They're either taking public transportation or using their own cars, which the union frowns upon because if they get in an accident, it's on them. With the ongoing construction boom throughout the five boroughs, there are only 20 inspections, inspectors with 840 construction sites to be visited on a monthly basis. On the other, on the other hand, suppression unit has only 41 inspectors with 58,000 sprinkler standpipe accounts and growing 8% every year. In 2008 and 2014, fire code provisions <coughs> for more detailed inspections which put a substantial load on the existing issue with the manpower compared to the extensive workload on the Bureau. District office is operating at a capacity of just over 50 percent. If we had more fire protection inspectors, we would be able to operate at 100 percent and could generate over 100 million dollars annually for the city. Thank you very much. I just have one question. Uh, well, maybe two. Um, 41 inspectors for 58,000 sprinkler and stamp pipe systems. How, how often are they required to be inspected? They're required to be, uh, they're required to be inspected every five years. Okay. All right, but uh, if they see a lot of buildings that the um, suppression unit goes out to, our main thing is if they see any other problems, on their way as they're doing an inspection, they will actually go there and just do an inspection. If we get, sometimes we'll get the battalion chief will call or the division may call and say they've done BI and they've seen a problem with the standpipe or the sprinkler system, so they'll call us to come out and we'll do an inspection. 
or if we see a building that requires where they took the system out, we'll, we, uh, we make them put the system back in the building. Is, is the 41 inspectors adequate to make 58,000 inspections in five years? No, not at all. Uh, I mean, just r rough estimate, and again, uh, you know, uh, unofficially, what is the percentage of standpipe systems that do not go uninspected within the five-year period? Um, I can't give you that number. I could probably get back to you, but it is a lot. Is it like, uh, is it half, or is it 10 percent, or is it, I mean? I would say maybe 40 40 percent? Mm-hmm. And then just, so in a, in a borough like Staten Island where there's just not any public transit in some parts, um, I, I, if I was an inspector, I would roll my eyes if you sent me to Staten Island. <laughs> but, is, you know, it, it would take one inspector an entire day to inspect uh, a, a building that's not near public transit because you'd be hiking for a mile. Um, is there a, a, a problem with, is there a, a reduced rate even with Staten Island specifically? Or in other transit deserts that we've identified? No, well, I would say Queens. We have a lot of we have a problem with Queens getting to a lot of places than Brooklyn because those boroughs are very big. Staten Island, we have a district office, uh, district office eight. Uh, they're in well twelve eight we call it because it spits Brooklyn and uh, Staten Island. They're able to get out there and they, they do inspections and all types. Of, remember, Staten Island doesn't. I used to live in Staten Island for for many years. Uh, I had to go to Dallas. Anyway, Staten Island is great. Not knocking that now. The the problem is is that um, you have a couple of high rise buildings, but not as many as Manhattan in Brooklyn. If you can see like Hudson Yards, Hudson Yards is my that's my project. I'm the deputy chief inspector in charge of Hudson Yards. So um, Staten Island, we we're able to cover Staten Island as far as inspectors, as far even the sprinkler, we're able to cover Staten Island pretty well. And even on the rare case where where uh, a unit does bi and, and just calls you guys in, then you no problem responding. No, no, no problem at all. That's all I have. Uh, Justin, do you have any questions? Nope. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. All right. All right, seeing no one else, thank you very much, everyone.